let me first check whether you'll be able to hear me okay in back. Can you hear in back? It's a pleasure to be with you on this day. In fact, it's a pleasant surprise to see people here rather than home with their loved ones. <laughs> and those of you who have not already bought your heart-shaped red box of chocolate, you still have a few hours to do it. Don't miss the opportunity. I want to begin straight in by reading to you a short story. Here it goes. In the beginning, all people lived around a great ironwood tree in the jungle, speaking the same language. One man, whose testes were enormously swollen from infection with a parasitic worm, spent his time sitting on a branch of the tree so that he could rest his heavy testes on the ground. Out of curiosity, animals of the jungle came up and sniffed at his testes. Hunters then found the animals easy to kill, and everyone had plenty of food and was happy. Then, one day, a bad man killed the husband of a beautiful woman in order to get the woman for himself. Relatives of the dead husband attacked the murderer, who was in turn defended by his own relatives, until the murderer and his relatives climbed up into the ironwood tree in order to save themselves. But the attackers tugged on lianas hanging from one side of the ironwood tree in order to pull the tree's crown down towards the ground and get at their enemies. Finally, the lianas snapped in half, causing the tree to spring back with tremendous force. The murderer and his relatives were hurled out of the tree into many different directions. They landed so far away in so many different places that they never found each other again. With time, their languages became more and more divergent. And that is why people today speak so many different languages and cannot understand each other, and why it's hard work for hunters to catch animals for food. <laughs> That's a story that was related to me by people from the Sakari tribe, a small tribe of 600 people on the island of New Guinea in the Lakes Plains area of northwest Indonesia, Indonesian New Guinea. Obviously, it's what's called an origins myth, similar to the story, the biblical story of the Garden of Eden and the Tower of Babel. Origin myths are widespread, not only in every tribal society, but in modern state societies. But the Sakari tribe of New Guinea lacked, church, lacked churches, they lacked priests, they lacked sacred books. Do Sakari be beliefs constitute a religion? What is a religion? What's similar and what's different between tribal religions and state religions? When did religion begin? Whenever it began, we can surely agree that our closest relatives, the chimpanzees, did not have religion six million years ago when our ancestors and the ancestors of chimps diverged. But did the Cro-Magnons, behaviorally modern humans of 30,000 years ago, did the Cro-Magnons already have a religion? And do Sakari beliefs constitute a religion? Can one ask about the function of religion, regardless of the truth of religion? It's difficult and, in fact, offensive to ask about the function of our own religion. It's easy to ask about the Sakari religion or about the belief of the Homeric Greeks and many gods. Institutions of human societies have functions. They have adaptive values. Human institutions promote, to varying degrees, survival. They promote the success of a society vis-a-vis -vis other societies. But is are all human institutions adaptive? There's an ongoing debate among anthropologists and archaeologists about the adaptive value of human institutions. Religion is essentially universal 
among human societies. All traditional human societies have had something called religion. But it involves a huge investment in time and in resources, and thereby incurs lost opportunity costs. Namely, if religion weren't doing society some good, then religion would be diverting resources that, and time that could be devoted to other things. So you would think that religion must provide some benefits to human societies. Otherwise, there would be some societies that would discover that they didn't have to have a religion, and they wouldn't be wasting all the time and resources on the religion and would gain an advantage. So you, must, you might guess that religion must convey some advantages on religious societies. Does religion, in fact, do society some good? If so, what good does it do? The answer isn't obvious. Well, and that question, of course, is independent of the truth of a religion. There are thousands of religions in the world, and it, one can ask, quite apart from whether each of those thousands of religions is true, if you don't believe that some other religion is true, you can still ask, what benefit does it bring to its society? You can pose the same question for the arts, which, again, represent a huge investment for human societies. Music, dance, visual arts like sculpture and painting and decoration and jewelry. We put a huge amount of resources and time and energy into the arts. What is the function of a really expensive performance of Handel's Messiah? What good does it do a society? Or what's the value of our art museums into which we put billions of dollars? If they didn't have a function, you would think that societies that didn't have art would thereby gain an advantage over societies without art because they could be putting the time and money and energy into other things. There is discussion of the possible functions of art. It offers shared social bonds within a society. It offers a society cohesion against enemy societies. It offers contentment to members of a society. It teaches a society's values. It motivates members of, of a society. But one can then ask, is art purely adaptive? Or does our investment in art go far beyond the adaptive value of art? Or does art have any adaptive value at all? But you can ask those same questions for religion. Does a religion have any adaptive value? And does our investment in religion go far beyond its adaptive value? Or does maybe religion has no adaptive value at all? Why is it that religion frequently preaches murder and intolerance, as notably Christianity and Islam have done in the last thousand years? Why does religion preach these destructive values as well as noble values? A starting point would be to try to define religion, to try to identify something that all religions share with each other, something shared by Christian God and the Greek gods and by the tribal spirits of the Sakari people. One frequent definition of religions invokes belief in God or supernatural agents, and so one could say that religion is defined by belief in a postulated supernatural agent for whose existence our senses cannot give us evidence, but that agent is invoked to explain things of which our senses do give us evidence. Would that be a satisfactory definition of religion shared among all religions, but differentiating religion from anything that isn't religion? But there's a problem. The Buddha Many Jews and Unitarians, including Jewish rabbis and Unitarian ministers whom I know, and many Japanese people are agnostics or atheists, and yet they're considered religious. If we're not going to define religion by belief in a supernatural agent or gods, how else might we define religion? Could we define it by an assemblage of features of which a religion doesn't have to have all of them, but must have some of them. So what I'd like to do is to survey what seem to me disparate attributes of religions, 
these attributes, it seems to me, differ among different societies and among different religions. And it seems to me that in the last 10 and a half thousand years, since the origins of agriculture, religion has changed its functions, and some of these attributes of religion have risen, and others have declined. One attribute of religion, an early attribute of religions, seems to me explanation. For example, the origin myths of the Bible, the origin myth about the Garden of Eden and the Tower of Babel. Origin myths are universal among religions to explain the existence of the world and the existence of people and to explain the diversity of language as in the case of the Sakari ironwood tree or the Tower of Babel. The Greeks of Homer's time also used the gods to explain many other things besides the world and the diversity of languages and people. The Homeric Greeks invoke gods to explain each sunrise and sunset and to explain the tides and to explain the winds, all in terms of gods. New Guinea tribes use supernatural agents to explain bird songs and some bird species, which are considered to be transformed people. Over the last particularly couple of thousand years, especially in the last few centuries, though, science has gradually encroached on this explanatory function of religion. The Big Bang is now invoked to explain the existence of the world. Evolution is invoked to explain people and birds. Historical linguistics is invoked to explain the diversity of languages. Astronomy is used to explain sunsets and tides. Meteorology is used to explain winds. And ethology is used to explain bird songs. Nevertheless, more than 50% of Americans today still invoke God in order to explain the human species and perhaps other species as well. The last bastion of religious explanation today among those who accept scientific explanations for most other things would be God as first cause. That's to say, science still has nothing to tell us about why a universe of space and time and matter and physical laws exists at all. In my freshman year at Harvard, um, Harvard had recently recruited the great theologian Paul Tillich, who taught a course to skeptical Harvard undergraduates, a course in religion. And Tillich really had a tough sell in, in dealing with these hyper-rational Harvard undergraduates, agnostics, and atheists. And, and Tillich really shook us up in 1955 when he asked, why is, in his co course on religion, why is there something when there could have been nothing? Or Tillich, in his strong German accent, came out, why is there something when there could have been nothing? And that really shook up hyper-rational Harvard undergraduates who didn't have any answer to him. In short, then, explanation is a function of religion, which I think was maximal in early religions, in tribal societies, and which has decre decreased or even disappeared in recent times in some societies. So explanation, I'd suggest, is an early function, maybe one of the original functions of religion. That's one function. A second function of religions, or some religions at some times, involves standard organizations to teach political obedience. Today, each organized religion has its priests, or rabbis, or mullahs, and they're usually full-time, and they're paid or supported by adherents of the religion. Churches, as we know them, organized churches have standardized architecture, standardized sacred books, so every Christian church will have a Bible, standardized rituals, standardized art, music, and clothes. But all of those features, standardized features of organized religions, are absent in tribal societies. At best, tribal societies may have part-time shamans, but they're not full-time professional shamans. 
They'll have occasional rituals, such as initiation rituals, but those rituals of tribal societies play more social roles, usually, than religious roles. Why, then, did standardized organization arise with modern organized religions? Partly, standardized religious organization arose in order to deal with the political problems of populous societies. Over the last 10,000 years, human societies have gotten more and more populous. Until 10,000 years ago, everybody was living in small bands or groups of a few dozen individuals, and now we live in state societies of up to 1 billion, 300 million individuals. You can't politically, you can't politically govern 1 billion, 300 million people in the same way that you can govern and reach decisions in a tribe of a few dozen people. A popular society needs leaders for making decisions and for executing decisions. In a group of 30 people in a tribal society, you can have face-to-face -face decisions, face-to-face decision-making, but you can't have face-to-face decision-making once you've got a few thousand people. And yet, popular societies, if a popular society can figure out how to organize itself and reach decisions and govern itself, a popular society automatically gains an enormous advantage over a small society, provided that technology is equal. And yet, in a popular society that requires decision makers, like kings and bureaucrats, those kings and bureaucrats have to be fed, and basically, feeding the politicians, the kings and bureaucrats, constitutes theft. They're taking food and money from the masses. How in any popular society do the decision makers, the leaders, justify their theft of money and food from the masses? That's a question that we Americans, we in a democracy, ask ourselves at every election. What have the politicians done to justify their salaries. Kings have existed since something like 3500 BC, and chiefs existed already by 5500 BC or perhaps earlier. How have kings and chiefs throughout history justified what is basically theft? Well, every known, every chiefdom of which we have any information in every early state society solved this problem by organized religion, whose priests, mullahs, etc., and whose rituals reinforced the teachings of the kings and chiefs. Namely, in early state societies and chiefdoms, the kings and chiefs have always asserted that they were semi-divine or divine and that they are related to the gods. They are uniquely able to intercede with the gods for the benefit of society, for example, to send rain or to produce a good harvest. And if nevertheless there's a drought or famine or other bad things happen, then the king or chief shifts the blame onto the peasants who are accused of being disobedient. But already before there were organized state and chiefdom societies, already tribal societies routinely blame bad things on their own violation of a society's rules, so it was not much of an extension for the king or chief if the harvest was not delivered in return for the chief's prayers, for the king or chief to say, that's not my failure, it's because you guys violated society's rules. So the king or chief renders a service, delivers rain, delivers a good harvest, and in return for those services, then the religion teaches that the peasants should feed the king and the chief and the priests and the tax collectors. Nowadays, religion has become much less the handmaiden of state societies, which religion formerly universally was. But religion still is connected with, justifies the state, Today, in many countries, in some Muslim countries, in Israel, it was the case in Italy and Japan until 60 years ago, and it still is the case in Britain and in Scandinavia, which have state-supported churches. It still is partly the case in the United States. On our currency, here is a dollar bill which says, in God we trust, 
That's the national currency of our land. Our government pays for official chaplains in Congress and in the armed services. So where is our first function, the first function of religion that I mentioned, the explanatory function, is one that I see as having decreased over time and some societies disappeared over the last 10,000 years. This second function of promoting support of state government is one that originated in the last 7,500 years and increased over that time and then in modern times has been de decreasing as at least some modern state governments have figured out how to command loyalty from its citizens without claiming that the president is divinely descended from God. That's the second function. So we got explanation, buttressing of centralized decision makers. A third function of religion has to do with the teaching of moral precepts by religions that do have standardized organization. All major religions teach what is right and what's wrong. Most familiar to Christians and Jews are the Ten Commandments, moral precepts, but church teachings in general beyond the Ten Commandments. In tribal societies, we take for granted, that's to say we in Judeo-Christian societies and in Islamic societies, we take for granted this association of religion with moral precepts. And so it might surprise us to discover that there's much less or none of this association of moral precepts with religion in tribal societies, where instead one's obligations and moral precepts depend upon your personal relationships. If you violate your obligations to other people, then you're under social pressure from your fellow tribes people. And if you end up in a dispute in a tribe, then everybody in the tribe is affected and they may pull the disputants apart because a dispute in a tribe threatens cohesion of the tribe. In a tribal society, if you meet a stranger, uh, in New Guinea, I've been in situations like this, and where New Guineans meet a stranger, the routine response is either to try to kill a stranger or run away so the, the stranger won't kill you. There, the question never arises in traditional New Guinea society of how to establish peaceful relations with a stranger. How ridiculous. You're not going to have peaceful relations with a stranger. If you see a stranger on your territory, it's always for something bad, scouting out conquest or coming to steal your women. And so, of course, if you encounter a stranger, you try to kill him or else you run away. The issue of how to establish peaceful relationships with a stranger just doesn't arise in tribal societies. That meant that when, in the last 10,000 years, we started to develop popular societies where you no longer knew everybody by name, but where you were encountering strangers within the society itself, and you had to be peaceful. Within the last 10,000 years, for the first time, we encountered the problem of meeting strangers who were members of your own society, because your own society was too numerous for you to know by name and relationship to everybody else. In a state or chiefdom level society, if you encounter a stranger who's a member of your own society, you'd better not kill him or her because then his or her relatives and supporters and friends are going to join in and you're going to get a brawl that threatens to tear apart the society and drive it to collapse. So all chiefdoms in early states face this problem of how to get people within the society to maintain peaceful relationships with strangers, a problem that just didn't exist in tribal societies. The solution was standard, standardized, organized religions which proclaim the rules of behavior for the society, such as the Ten Commandments, but every organized religion of a popular society had similar rules which taught you not to kill strangers in your own society. The basic rule of all these moral codes is you do not kill someone unless there's some special cause. 
those rules are believed to have come down from the gods. The chief or the king and his or her agents enforce the rules in the name of religion and therefore breaking the political rules, the legal rules for organizing the society is an offense against the gods. In modern state societies, this third function of religion, namely moral precepts, has been partly superseded. In modern state societies, political leaders and the courts make and enforce laws, often without reference to religion in many societies. Atheists and believers don't kill because societal values have been instilled into them and because they fear punishment. But nevertheless, religious law is still a force in some Muslim societies today. So here we have a function of religion, the function of moral precepts, which I think surprisingly to us members of state societies was not an important function in tribal societies and has increased over the last 10,000 years and is still strong in some but not all state societies today. What I see is the fourth function of religion besides explanation and moral precepts and maintaining peace within a society is the use of religion to justify wars. This again was not a problem for, is not a problem for tribal societies. Tribes face no moral problem in killing somebody else from another tribe because the moral rules of tribes are based on your personal relationships and you don't have personal relationships with people from another tribe and so there's no problem in killing people from another tribe. But now, when you have a state or chiefdom that has taught you, thou shalt not steal or kill, how can a state that has taught you, thou shalt not steal or kill, then turn around and order its citizens to steal from or to kill citizens of another state? At minimum, that's very confusing. The solution in all religiously buttressed state societies and chiefdoms has been to say that the moral precepts, the Ten Commandments, apply only to your behavior towards citizens of your own state, and it's taught that your religion has a monopoly on the truth, all other religions are wrong, you are not only permitted, you're obliged to steal from or kill believers in those false religions. The, particularly the, the Old Testament of the Bible is full of exhortations to kill believers in other religions. And I'd like to remind you of some of the things that the Old Testament says, and then I'll remind you of something that the New Testament also says. In the Old Testament book of Deuteronomy, chapter 20, Deuteronomy explain, uh, explains the obligation of Israelites to practice genocide. Here's what you're supposed to do, according to Deuteronomy. When your army approaches a distant city, you should enslave all its inhabitants if the distant city surrenders, but you should kill all its men and enslave its women and children and steal their cattle and everything else if it doesn't surrender. But if that city is a city of the Canaanites or Hittites, or any of those other abominable believers in false gods, then our true God commands you to kill everything that breathes in the city. And now if we turn to the Old Testament book of Joshua, the book of Joshua describes with approval how Joshua became a great hero by carrying out those instructions faithfully. Uh, Joshua slaughtered all the inhabitants over, of over 400 cities and that was wonderful and admirable. Then if we go on to the book of rabbinical commentaries known as the Talmud, the Talmud analyzes the potential ambiguities arising from conflicts between those two principles. One principle that says, thou shalt not kill, believers in thine own God. And then the other principle that says, thou must kill, believers in another God. That may sound confusing. And so some Talmudic commentaries resolve the complications as follows. An Israelite is guilty of murder, according to 
some Talmudic commentaries, if the Israelite intentionally kills a fellow Israelite. The Israelite is innocent of murder if he intentionally kills a non-Israelite. But the Israelite is also innocent if he kills an Israelite while throwing a stone into a group consisting of nine Israelites plus one heathen because he might have been aiming for that one heathen. So that's the Old Testament. The New Testament um, is less into that buttressing of killing adherence to all those other bad faiths, but there's still some of it in the New Testament. And for example, the New Testament book of Revelations, chapter 9, verses 4 and 5, spells out what you can do to heathens. It is perfectly okay to torture heathens for up to five months, just as long as you don't kill the heathens. So that's the New Testament. In fact, of course, some of the worst, in fact, the worst, no, some of the worst slaughters in recorded history were committed by European Christians against non-European non-Christians, and there have also been large-scale slaughters committed by Muslims against non-Muslims. That con tradition of killing adherents of all those false religions continues today but more recently, European states have emphasized ethnic reasons over religious reasons for killing others. For example, the Nazis, while the Nazis killed Jews, they also killed gypsies. So here we have a function of religion that has increased over the last 7,000 years with state societies and persists today, but perhaps is less marked today than it was thousands of years ago, when it was just routine. Of course, you killed all those believers in false religions. So now, we can go back to the question, does our huge investment in religion serve a function? The evolutionary biologist, David Sloan Wilson, wrote a book called Darwin's Cathedral, in, in which he argued that the function of religions is to enable adherence of, adherence of that religion to outcompete out other religions by a process of group selection. And Wilson argued that religions provide advantages to societies adopting the religion in several different ways. The advantage of increasing the number of adherents. One way that a religion serves to increase the number of adherents to the religion is that the precepts of a religion may favor survival and multiplication of its adherence. A religion may teach taking care of your fellow believers. It may teach you to be clean, have clean practices, so you're less likely to get sick. It may teach you to educate the children of your religion. For example, one can ask, in the early Roman Empire, in the centuries after Christ. There were hundreds or thousands of sects. And initially, Christianity was just one of those hundreds or thousands of sects. So why did Christianity become so successful and eventually become the religion of the Roman Empire? Christians might argue that it's because the precepts of Christianity were true, but the adherence to the hundreds or thousands of other sects would say, and an evolutionary biologist would argue, there must be some other reason than the truth of the precepts. In fact, early Christianity had precepts and social practices that provided advantages to, advantages to Christians. Early Christianity favored having babies, whereas the Roman Empire otherwise was not ha into having lots of babies. Christianity provided opportunities for women that otherwise were absent in Roman times. Christianity emphasized taking care of your fellow Christians, and the result was lower death rates during epidemics. And Christianity also preached the doctrine of selective forgiveness, which is frequently misinterpreted as turning, turning your cheek. But in fact, it's much more complex. It's selective forgiveness. And studies have shown that selective forgiveness, not forgiving all the time, but forgiving under certain circumstances, 
may in fact provide advantages, may be the best way of resolving disputes, and may provide you advantages in the future. You may be better off forgiving under certain circumstances. Similarly, it's argued that Judaism provides advantages to adherents of Judaism by placing emphasis on education and on business skills. And In fact, just before today's talk, um, I was um, we were in a conversation about Zoroastrianism, where I learned that adherents of Zoroastrianism also emphasize education and business skills, and there's another religion that has lasted for 2,500 years. Whether or not the precepts are true, they certainly provide advantages to the adherents of the religion. So that's one way in which a religion can provide advantages to its adherents. Another way is that religions can promote smooth function within a society by the moral precepts that enable disputes within the society to be resolved without people killing each other and the society breaking down. A third way in which religions can, the teachings of religions may serve to spread the precepts is that some religions actively proselytize, encourage adherents to go in and convert adherents of other religions. And that's true of Christianity and Islam, but it has not been true of Judaism. And still another way that a religion can promote adherence, adherence to itself and discourage adherence to other religions is by the technique of killing adherents of other religions. So those are in a number of ways that David Sloan Wilson has argued that a religion actually promotes adherence to the religion and promotes the society that adopts the religion. One can then say that from, from a social point of view, if we were an extraterrestrial from outer space who came to Earth and was not predisposed to believe that any religion has true precepts, the extraterrestrial would argue that the success of a, of a religion as gauged by the number of its adherents is unrelated to the, tr the truth of the precepts of the religion and depends on the precepts of the religion only insofar as those precepts favor survival of the adherence of the religion or favor a smooth functioning of the society or favor converting adherence of competing religions or favor killing members of other religions. For example, in the case of the Mormon religion, Mormons accept the claim of Joseph Smith that the angel Moroni appeared to Joseph Smith on September 21, 1823 and revealed golden tablets buried on a hilltop near Manchester Village in western New York State. Mormons believe that, non-Mormons don't believe that, but belief in that claim, regardless of whether it was true or not, belief in that claim has contributed to the rapid growth of the Mormon church because its believers are also taught other things such as to have many children and to devote two years to proselytizing to the Mormon religion at your own expense and Mormons are taught to pay 10% of your income to the church. So this is a very successful religion. Similarly, religions often motivate adherents of the religion to sacrifice themselves for the religion. For example, by teaching that if you sacrifice yourself, if you die in battle for the religion, then you will go to a heaven populated with beautiful virgins. It's those beliefs that make religious fanatics so dangerously effective against other societies. A tiny minority of the fanatics dies believing that they will go to heaven with beautiful virgins. But as a result of the deaths of a small number of fanatics, they kill far more of their perceived enemies and thereby promote the religion of the fanatics against other religions. For example, in the attack on the World Trade Center, 19 fanatics died, and they thereby killed about 2,800 
of believers in competing views. That kill ratio of 2,800 to 19 is a very favorable kill ratio. In tribal societies, you just don't get that religious fanaticism. In my 40 years in New Guinea, I've heard lots of stories from New Guinea friends of mine of genocidal attacks against other tribes, but I've never heard a hint in New Guinea of any religious motive. I've never heard a New Guinea tribes person talking about dying for God or dying for the true religion or sacrificing himself or herself for any idealistic reason at all. Instead, every individual New Guinean in an attack against another tribe tries to survive. There's no medal in New Guinea tribal societies for throwing yourself onto a hand grenade in order to save your own buddies. So, I see religion as having had a number of functions which have grown or waned over the last 10,000 years. But I'd like to say in conclusion, in case this social reasoning about religion gives you offense, that these proposed functions are of course debated, and even insofar as they might have some value, they're certainly not the whole explanation for religions. We sing in Handel's Messiah or we listen to Handel's Messiah, not just because Handel's Messiah motivates us to go out and kill the heathen and to take care of our own sick people, but also because Handel's Messiah moves us and we find it beautiful. That's all that I wanted to say to speculate about the functions of religion, and I promise to stop before one hour and we can now have some time for discussion and questions and your own opinions on this controversial subject. <laughs> Who would like to offer another opinion? Yes. <laughs> yeah. is your emphasis on geographical factors, what you call uh, the continent and environment explaining civilization. Now, when it comes to religion, how do you relate the geographical features of a particular society to whatever religious ca characteristics of that society? Very interesting question. How, how might one relate geography, or how, how might one relate religions to the geographical features of a society? Um, a first pass explanation would be to say that religion has no relationship to geography because around the world on all the continents these differences between tribal and chiefdom and state level religions exist. The features of state religions that I mentioned apply to the Inca Empire of South America and to the Aztec Empire of Central America and to empires and kingdoms of Europe and Asia and Africa. So to a first approximation, one would say there's no relationship between geography and religion. But on the other hand, people have also often commented on the fact that monotheistic religions seem to have been concentrated in Western Asia in the eastern Mediterranean. And people have speculated, why is it that Judaism and Christianity and Islam all arose in a rather small area of the world? And there's been speculation. Is there something about the Mediterranean environment and a herding society that promoted a monotheistic religion? People have speculated about that. I don't know whether those speculations have a validity. That's the only strong correlation that I've heard advanced between geography and the form of religion. It's a very interesting question and unresolved. Yes? Um, Dr. Diamond, in your discussion, I've um, noticed you focus more on the transcendent aspects of religion, the, the external deity. I was wondering whether you might comment also on the more imminent experiences that tie people to their religious faiths individually the more perhaps mystical experiences that they attribute to also to to their religious beliefs. 
what about the what about the the less the external than the internal functions of religion um, in the mystical experiences involved in religion? I don't know. I haven't thought about that. I will have to. I don't have anything intelligent to say at the moment, but I will have to think at leisure about it. Yes. You've traced a number of characteristics of religion through time, and um, just maybe to get yourself in a bit more trouble, uh, would you like to speculate on those characteristics in the future? Would I like to speculate on those characteristics of religion in the future? Uh, um, by extrapolation from the recent past, um, I would guess that the explanatory function of religion will continue to ge decrease as science increases. The functions of religion in holding society together may continue to decrease, but not necessarily disappear. Um, the functions of religion in motivating warfare, we now have other excuses for warfare today, but it doesn't look as if the war motivating functions of religion are going to disappear in the near future. And those would be my guesses for the next 30 years, but I would hesitate to make any guesses beyond the next 30 years. <laughs> yes? Can I ask this very small uh, question? It seems that, I, I know in your talk you were talking about a very long time scale in the last 10,000 years, but it seems to me that even in the last couple of generations, the role of religion or the function of religion has changed a lot in the world. Can you maybe comment on that, or why do you think religion is rising at this stage after we had uh, more uh, non-religious times, a couple of generations ago? Interesting question. Um, well, since my time scale has been mostly a time scale of 10,000 years, what about a shorter time scale? Um, over the last few decades, um, it may appear that religion is rising again. To me, it seems much more of a mixed bag. In some areas, yes, religion is rising. In other areas, religion really is crashing. For example, I lived for four years in Europe in the late 1950s and early 1960s, and in Northern Europe and Northwestern Europe, the state religions, the Anglican Church in the UK and the state religions in Scandinavia um, are much weaker now than they were even a generation or two ago. Um, so I think, and yet there, but there are also conspicuous ex examples of societies where re religion seems to be a stronger motivating force. I would hesitate to conclude that for the world as a whole, religion has become stronger rather than weaker. Instead, it seems to me more of a patchwork over recent decades. Yes. Perhaps because I'm an adherent of Judaism, uh, I was particularly uh, uh, provoked by your choice of texts in describing sort of uh, Ju Judaic history. And I'm, I'm curious about your thoughts about evolution within one faith and the change in emphases uh, textually from one generation to the other. Uh, in particular, your references to, uh, to biblical sources that are not in the mainstream of usage in Judaism today. And I would imagine would be same, the same story for Christian sources talking about uh, the way you can torture someone for five months. I don't think that's central necessarily of today's Christianity. Uh, is that just a momentary change in culture of religion, or is it something that we could see? Will, will it go back to that as a primary focus, speculatively? Sure. You're absolutely correct that the, that the quotes I took from the Old Testament uh, do not represent mainstream Judaism, just as the quote that I took from the book of Revelations does not represent mainstream Christianity. Uh, I took these quotes instead as expressions of what one would infer were widespread attitudes 2,500 or 3,000 years ago, but are not widespread attitudes today. How is it going to go in the next 10, 20 years? And this, this is our question again, and I would hesitate to predict. One infer, infers that they were, well, how does one know that these beliefs were widespread 2,500 or 3,000 years ago? In a couple of ways, from, from the religious texts themselves that say these things approvingly, where 
uh, Jew, uh, Jewish text or Christian text today would never say those things approvingly. And also from all the historical evidence, all the historical texts describing wars of religion ever since we started having writing 5,500 years ago. Wars of religions? The, the The Old Testament is a good starting point. A more, a more, more, recent, more recent starting point 500 years ago um, are the, the letters and the texts written by the Spanish conquistadors um, from the New World. Um, I mean, if you want something really chilling, um, just read the accounts of the Spanish conquistadors around the time of the conquest of the Inca Empire and the justifications for the Spanish invasion of Peru. But that doesn't do Judaism. I'm sorry? That has nothing to do with Judaism. Nothing to do with Judaism? No, that has to do with Christianity. <laughs> yes? Uh, you are mentioning the culture of the technology of coexisting, uh, a secular, mostly atheistic culture, and, um, and a religious. In, in the United States, it's mostly Christian, but it has other religions elsewhere. What I was thinking is, is rather than, if it's possible, that rather than an evolution, those two cultures have, in, to a large extent, coexisted for a long time. I was thinking, for example, the Roman culture, which is very much a government-based structure, which is very um, tolerant of any kind of possible belief system. Mm -hmm. and, um, and I was also wondering how you see the difference between a dynamic of a single individual that does things versus the dynamics of a community of people that believe in certain things in the same way. It is on the possibility of building a kind of meta-organism out mm -hmm. of people with common beliefs. Mm -hmm. A couple of interesting questions. The, in, in reverse order, the, the, the issue of an individual versus a community. And then your first question, the coexistence, certainly in the modern world, of more religious and less religious segments of the society or more tolerant and less tolerant segments of the society? They're both interesting big questions. The, let me take, take the, the second question, the ro role of individuals. If one's to view religion as a social phenomenon, an extreme perspective might say that, might be that Mohammed or Christ had no specific role. If there had not been Mohammed, there would have been someone else in Arabia around that time who would have come up with doctrines that prom promoted a Arabic expansion. And if there had not been Christ around that time, there would have been some other leader. In the case of what was happening in the Roman Empire at the time, we know I'm more aware that there were hundreds and hundreds of competing sects. And again, a being from Mars would say, well, if there hadn't been Christ, there would have been someone else. I don't know myself that much about what was going on in Saudi Arabia at the time of Mohammed, or whether, again, there were lots of competing sects then. And if there had not been Mohammed, there would have been someone else. This is a big unresolved question. Of that. And for me, it's particularly acute about, about the Arabic expansion. Were there demographic, demographic or social forces behind the Arabic expansion and Muhammad was just the spark? Or did he play a unique role and would, without Muhammad, would there have been no Arabic expansion? I don't know. Yeah? Do I believe in a universal human nature? Uh, interesting you ask that question because uh, in my, uh, in my lecture to UCLA, UCLA undergraduates yesterday. I'm, t I'm teaching a course this quarter on tribal societies, and yesterday's lecture was on human sexuality. And so a question arose, uh, are there universals of human sexuality? On the one hand, I'd say there's enormous diversity in human sexual practices. On the other hand, there are sexual near universals. Every human society of which we have knowledge has had an institution of marriage or something related to marriage. 
every human society that we know about has had bans on incest, except under specific circumstances such as Inca brother-sister marriage. The great majority of traditional human societies have permitted polygyny, one man marrying multiple wives. Only a tiny minority, something like 2%, has permitted polyandry, one woman marrying multiple husbands. So at least as far as sexual practices are concerned, there are near universals. Uh, it's also uh, um, conflict in tribal society was nearly universal. Most tribal societies of which we have knowledge did engage in violence and wars. There are a few that didn't, and there are specific reasons why they didn't. Yeah, so yes, there are, I think there are some human universals or near universals. Yes. How likely do you think uh, it is that we have another axial age where we have this uh, rapid generation of new religions uh, in, the present and the, well, in the present and the future, considering the uh, decreasing uh, functional value of religion? How likely are we in the, uh, in the f near future to have a proliferation of religions, new religions, in the face of, in some senses, a decreasing function of religion today. Um, a, a friend of mine, an anthropologist who worked in New Guinea in the 1960s when there was a lot of first contact going on, the outside world conquer, um, contacting New Guinea tribes. And the first contact, contacts in New Guinea were made either by government patrol officers or often by missionaries who with great courage went into uncontacted areas and contacted them with a the motivation then of spreading the religion. And my anthropologist friend said cynically, um, if you give me a modest amount of money and if you want to draw up on paper any arbitrary religion with any beliefs whatsoever, um, I can guarantee you 5,000 converts to your arbitrary beliefs within the next 10 years given $50,000 because that $50,000 will support a missionary to New Guinea who will go out and will convert New Guineans. I've also seen why the New Guineans get converted. Uh, they can get converted because the missionary comes in and constructs an airstrip and brings in Western goods and t-shirts and pots and pans and access to reading and some education. And New Guineans are willing to believe anything arbitrary for those benefits. So to go back to your question, what are the chances of a proliferation of new religions? Um, we are running out of first contacted people. Um, there may be, a, a, there are a few uncontacted groups left in Peru and a few left, left in New Guinea. And for those uncontacted groups, there's still the possibility with $50,000 of converting them to any arbitrary religion. But once these last uncontacted groups have been contacted, then it's going to be much harder, I'd say virtually impossible, for a new religion to spread in the face of the entrenched major religions. Yes, in back. Science a religion? Would I consider science a religion? No, I would not consider science a religion. Science is something, but it doesn't share these characteristics. Well, science does have explanation, and from the point of view of religion, one would say that science has usurped the function of religion. Uh, science, by and large, does not teach moral precepts. Science, by and large, is not the force that tells us to avoid conflict within our, within our society. And so science, for the most part, is not the force that tells us to go conquer the people next door. So by my definition of religion, I do not consider science a religion. Yes? Would I consider Confucianism a religion? I don't know enough about Confucianism to have, to have an opinion on it. My understanding is that Confucianism is often considered a religion, though it's also considered somewhat on the, the borderline between a set of moral cultural beliefs and a religion. But I'm not well informed enough to have an opinion about this. Sorry, I've got to write this down. Yes. Atheism, secularism, religion, and other things, we sometimes have a commonality in moral codes. What do you think is the source 
What's the source of our moral codes now and in, in the future? Um, a scientist or a social scientist or a political scientist um, or an extraterrestrial from outer space would say the source of a moral code is the requirements for a society to, to function smoothly without falling apart. And you need a moral code in order to do that. Now, religions would say there's more to it than that. But ultimately, I, I would say that moral codes have a political and social function. That without a moral code, a society is going to destroy itself. And societies have destroyed themselves. In back, yes? yes? Why do you think it's so difficult to look at religion from an objective point of view? Why is it so difficult to look at religions from an objective point of view? Because religious beliefs are ones that we feel passionately about. And they're unprovable, or many people would consider them unprovable. If something can be proved or refuted, we can discuss it dispassionately. One can discuss dispassionately whether the Watson and Crick model of DNA is valid, because if it is valid, you got the evidence. If not, you don't. You come up with the evidence against it. But religion is hard to prove. So that's a re reason we feel passionate about it. And also, religion is frequently used as a justification for killing people of other religions. And so if you're going to have a religious argument, the conclusion of the argument may be you're wrong and therefore you, get, you deserve to be killed. Those are some of the reasons for passion about religion. All the way in back. Um, uh, you mentioned that because moral cause societies destroy themselves, animals don't have moral cause and they have survived for millions of years. Animals don't have moral codes, but also animals don't have the, the moral dilemmas that we humans have. And in, in, in New Guinea societies, um, New Guinea societies, tribal societies, um, function with largely a relationship-based moral code. But chimpanzee societies and lion societies also fa function with a relationship-based moral code. In a chimpanzee society, chimpanzee brothers do not kill each other. They do kill genetically unrelated males. They do not kill females genetically unrelated of the same society. They may accept females from outside societies, but not males from outside societies. So chimpanzees have what one could call a moral code, but it's not a religious moral code. Yes? Yeah, I interesting question about the, the relative relative positive and negative functions of religion and, and so in, in, in modern society and say if comparing European society and, and American society. I must say that whenever whenever I am faced with a question about something that has both positive and negative respects and I'm asked to say whether the positive or negative respects prevail, uh, my instinct is to avoid giving a clear answer but to point out that there are both positive and negative respects. And if, if, for example, we compare the United States with Europe, one can certainly think of aspects of religion in the United States that I personally don't admire, such as um, religious pressure in the modern United States, some religious pressure in the modern United States to block understanding of biology and to block women's reproductive rights. And I would say that those are a couple of strongly negative function, n negative aspects of certain religions in the United States. But on the other hand, just think of the positive contributions of religion in the United States. The civil rights movement of the 1950s and 1960s, a major driving force of the civil rights movement was the churches. Um, 
in the environmental issues that we face today. The churches so far have not played a major role in what I would see as a major moral and society survival issue we're facing today. But within the last year, some of the most conservative religious groups in the United States have started to espouse environmental values. So, so I, I would say, talking out of both sides of my mouth, that there are both positive and negative sides, both in the United States and in Europe. Is religion indispensable? My Japanese friends would say no religion isn't indispensable. Um, in Japan, one can argue about whether, say, Shintoism is a religion or is a set of social beliefs. And if one does not, if, as many people would argue, that the Japanese are as a-religious as any people in the world, nevertheless, it's an extremely effectively functioning society. So that would be an argument that, no, you don't need religion for a successfully functioning society. But you've got to have something else. You, you certainly have to have social values and a moral code that keep peace within the society. Yes? Are there, are there good examples of religion as a revolutionary or radical uh, institution or movement? Religion as a revolutionary or radical movement? As opposed to conserving movements. As, oh, as opposed to conserving movements. I think, okay, there are a couple of separate questions there. Religion as adaptive or non-adaptive, and religion as radical revolutionary versus conservative. Possibly all religions at the time of their early meteoric spread are radical and revolutionary. They don't have to be revolutionary in a milit military sense, but they certainly are almost by definition a new religion is revolutionary in a social sphere. Mormonism was revolutionary in a social sphere. Christianity, Christ, early Christianity was revolutionary in a social sphere. Islam was revolutionary in both a social and a military sphere. Um, so th that's on conservative, conservative versus traditional. And then the other half of your question, could you remember? Adaptive. Oh, adaptive versus non-adaptive. That, I would say, is an open question. Um, because we take it for granted, because because usually we don't view religion as something adaptive. We start off with the perspective that religion is not adaptive. And it seems to me instead that there's a good deal in religion that is adaptive. But that's not to say that everything about religion is adaptive. And so having, if we are willing to acknowledge that there are some adaptive things about religion, then we could go on and look at all the non-adaptive things about religion. There are, there are religions which are non-adaptive in the sense that what they do causes them to die out. There was a, a religious group in, in 19th century America, I don't know if it was the Shakers, a religious group um, that did not have children and that relied on making converts. And for a while that carried on, but the Shakers are close to dying out or have died out their belief that one should not have children would seem, history seems to have taught us that it was a non-adaptive <coughs> belief. <laughs> yes, there, yeah. You talked about how uh, religion kind of binds society together and helps them grow, but has there ever been a, a society that, I mean, has there ever been a religion that caused a society to collapse? Has there been a religion that caused a society to collapse? Interesting question. <laughs> so what was the suggestion? Okay. That's a perfectly valid answer. Um, Jonestown. Uh, there, there have been suicidal religions. Or let me give you another example. Um, the modest society, Mahdi, M-A-H-D-I, of the Sudan, um, was uh, was a fanatically inspiring religious movement, which for a time was very successful in leading to the independence of the Sudan, and then became suicidally unsuccessful because at the ba Battle of Omdurman, um, the caliphate taught that 
believers would be immune to bullets. And the result was that within 30 minutes, 20,000 of the believers were killed by bullets of Kitchener's army. And the result of that false belief in protection against bullets was the destruction of the modest movement in the Sudan. So yes, religions can preach suicidally unsuccessful beliefs. One makes sure that everybody gets a chance. Yes? So how would you distinguish between something that's a religion and something that's a very dearly held lifestyle? And should our, um, our government, in terms of uh, First Amendment protections, be distinguishing between those two things? How would one d differentiate between religion and a strongly held lifestyle? And th that's a good question. It goes back to the question that one of you asked about Confucianism. Is Confucianism a religion? And I was not sure of the answer to that question. Um, well, one has to think about this. And, and there is a, or again, Shintoism. There may be a continuum from religions to strongly held lifestyles. And if there is a continuum, then one has to expect that there'll be a gray intermediate area where it gets difficult to decide. Uh, maybe you or maybe some of you can come up with criteria other than the four that I mentioned to help decide whether Confucianism or Shintoism are religion. Is Unitarianism a religion? There are Unitarians who do not believe in God, but it nevertheless, nevertheless, that's not to say that all Unitarians don't believe in God, as the name suggests, but there are, there are Unitarians who consider belief in God not to be a central part of their religion. Okay, is it a religion? It certainly is a strong community, or is it something other than a religion? Maybe that's in the gray area, or maybe my criteria just have to be sharpened. Yes? You uh, stated earlier that the that one of the reasons that we have religion is to establish moral codes and such and so on. And you also said that people uh, in modern societies who consider themselves to be atheistic or agnostic continue to follow those moral and social codes because they've been raised in the society that teaches them that killing is bad or stealing is bad or all of those things. Without the evolution of religion, would those moral codes still have evolved? Is there some inherency in human nature? And, um, just out of curiosity, are you a religious person? <laughs> in, in reverse order, the, the second question, really not. And the first question, um, in, in the absence of religions, would moral codes have evolved? Um, that's one of those impossible experiments. Um, it didn't happen. On the other hand, it's suspicious that human society, complex human societies developed independently in many different parts of the world. In Central America and in South America, state-level societies evolved. And state-level societies evolved in China. And state-level societies evolved in the Fertile Crescent. They were evolving in Africa. And yet all these independent evolutions of complex societies um, involved religions that buttressed the authority of the state level society. So that suggests that the answer to your question is that one observes that wherever there have been developments of complex societies in the last 5,000 years, it has been accompanied by religion and therefore it's been necessary. We don't have a counterexample to suggest that something else would have been possible. Yeah. What about a belief in, in an afterlife, and specifically in my experience in New Guinea? My understanding is that there, are, there, are, there, are, there, are, there certainly are religions that believe in an afterlife, and there are religions that don't believe in an afterlife and would deny that there's an afterlife. And in the New Guinea societies, of which I have knowledge, some of them believe that ancestors move over into the bodies of birds, and others believe that ancestors or that people, when they die, go up into the sky. And others believe that 
the people when they die, they're in the ground and they're planted, finished. N know that there's not an afterlife. So I would say that belief in an afterlife appears not empirically not to be a universal of religion. All the way in back. Okay, so it seems that in modern society, none of the functions of religion that you have put forth are necessary. Or religion is not necessary for any of those functions, right? You have all these functions. Um, just with the government, you know, the science, the legislation, or something, all that. So, if that's the case, why is it that religion seems to flourish as well as it does? Um, is there maybe another function that um, you're overlooking that causes religion to still flourish, even with all these other functions being met by government? Good, good question. Um, given that I've said that some of these traditional functions of religion have been taken over by other forces in modern times, that science has taken over much of explanation, and that government itself and legal systems have taken over the, the responsibility for maintaining peace. Um, is it the case, is there something else that I've neglected that causes, uh, has caused religions to persist today? There are a couple of possibilities. One is that, yes, there is something else besides that I've neglected that have caused religions to persist today. Um, one might say that, that I haven't talked about religion as providing meaning and that people seek meaning in life and many people can find meaning in life without religion but others find religion helpful in giving meaning in life. Uh, another, but another point of view would be that, that religion does not provide any unique functions today, and the fact that religion is still persisting uh, is because of an, an enormous inertia, of an enormous weight of tradition and of past history and transmission from generation to generation. And by this point, this interpretation, one might expect that religion over time will, will die out, but if it does, it's going to be thousands of years centuries, thousands of years before we know the answer. So your question is an interesting one, and I don't know what the answer to it is. Yeah? I was curious, you talked about religions are conscious to society. Um, is it necessary for every cultural artifact or every cultural institution to serve society outside of population itself? Key question. Yeah. Yeah, that, oh, that's a really central pr question in cultural anthropology. Um, is it necessary for a cultural feature to have a function other than propagating itself? No, certainly not. Um, really expensive, long-lasting institutions pr probably do need a function, otherwise there wouldn't be that investment in them. But one can think of lots of social institutions that not only have no function, but that are counteradaptive. Again, an example from the New Guinea area, among the Kaolong people on the southern watershed of the island of New Britain, until 1959, roughly 1959, Kaolong custom was that when a man died, his widow was always strangled by her brothers, and her brothers came to do it, and she cooperated in it. Now, is there any advantage to this institution of widow strangling among Kaolong people of New Guinea? It's present on the southern watershed of New Britain, but not on the northern watershed. Does widow strangling have a function in the southern watershed? And because of the different environment on the northern watershed, widow strangling is not useful there. I can't perceive any advantage to widow strangling. I can see some severe disadvantages. Uh, it makes it more difficult for the children to survive. So I would take this is an extreme example of a social institution that is counterfunctional, and one can think of myriads of other social institutions that are counterfunctional. I think what one can say is that the, mo the more investment there is in an institution, and the longer lasting the institution, and the more widespread the institution, the more likely it is that the institution will be found to have functions. Not to say to be totally functional, but to have functions. Yeah. There seem to be trade-offs between the function you mentioned, saying, for example, you mentioned the function of religion to have interactions with strangers on one hand, and then the function of religion to killing, um, killing adherents of other religions or converting these, these members of other religions. So my question is, might there be a role of how religions handle these trade-offs, or how good religions are in, you know, specifying the conditions under which 
moral, some moral code overrides another? Mm -hmm. Yeah, again, a very interesting question. So, so there are there are alternatives. You can, yeah. in a religion, you can kill the adherents of other religions, or you can not kill them and you can try to convert them, or you can not kill them and not try to convert them at all. A evolutionary biologist would describe these as different strategies for propagation of religion. Religions can propagate themselves in different ways and can outcompete competing religions in other ways. You can do it by killing the others, or you can do it by not killing but proselytizing, or you can do it without killing or proselytizing. The Jewish religion today is by and large not a proselytizing religion, but it's rather successful. Um, or you can do it by promoting having lots of babies, as has been the case with Mormon religion. Or in the case of the Shakers, you can do it without, in fact, by saying not to have babies. So there are many different strategies for a spread of religion. Which strategy works depends, depends partly on what one could call arbitrary features, but also on some external features. Um, a tiny religion, the, the Jewish religion or the Zoroastrian religion, um, would not work today if they said that they were going to propagate themselves by killing adherents of other religions. Of course, there just aren't enough Jews or Zoroastrians to, to make that work. Yes? You mentioned um, the widow strangulation, and I know that there are a few other religions in which widows are cast off and found not useful anymore. So is it in some Yes, it, it is true that there are other societies that, that either strangle widows or discard them. Does that mean that there's some use in some societies for the discarding or strangling widows, and that in the societies that don't strangle or discard widows, that use doesn't exist? Uh, it's a fair question. The alternative interpretation of your observation would be that, that societies consist of human societies or experiments. There are thousands of human societies, and they're coming up with all sorts of things. And, some, and they independently invent all sorts of things, so that there are lots of societies that have invented strangling or killing of widows. That's not to say that whenever there's a society that invents the strangling of widows, it has rediscovered a valuable function that other societies discovered in the most societies of law. It's just possible that it's one of the many bad ideas that pops up from time to time and eventually will get selected out. And maybe would that be a useful note on which to conclude? <laughs> Thank you very much.